Hello, my name is Dr. James Santa, the Director of International Academics of the Common Mission Project, and I'm happy to bring you concept three. So if you recall from our second concept video, which really delved into the desirability part of the mission model canvas, this is the follow on to it. Like, well, how do you actually find beneficiaries? So, you know, initially you're going to just start kind of piecing together Pete's individuals out of your network or uh, talking with your problem sponsor, but really getting in depth to how do you conduct beneficiary discovery is one of the foundational elements of this program. You got to get this piece right, just as I mentioned in the previous concept. So as a reminder, beneficiaries who are at the heart of the problem, those pains and gains, you know, the individual that would give you the biggest hug if you're able to get this solution right or to find this problem appropriately, they're on the right-hand side of the canvas under desirability. So beneficiaries is what we're going to be focusing our attention on today. So you're going to see some information that repeats a little bit from the previous concept, but there's a reason for that, and it really is helping make sure that you've got a good grasp on how to conduct the, one of the most quintessential elements of this program, beneficiary discovery. So uh, the first thing we'll highlight here, and there's a link in the slides for you to be able to take a look at some of this, but what I want to highlight here is a, a team of students, uh, this one particularly from Stanford University, that was uh, part of Hacking for Defense. And I want to highlight a couple of key points here in terms of why I'm showing you this particular slide. And what you'll notice is that the second bullet there is th this is what the team was uh, originally work working on. This is their original problem. But what was interesting around all of this is that as they went through and did the discovery, there was a pivot. So this goes back to the idea that the problem you start with is not the one that you usually end up working on. And that's because of your ability to get out there, talk with the subject matter experts, find those beneficiaries, and really understand what problem it is you're trying to solve. So you'll notice here, not only with that pivot, but the students really got out of the classroom, that 76 interviews with a variety of different types of beneficiaries and individuals that can inform the domain were interviewed. And what the team came away with was policy. So very, very, very powerful uh, mechanism of being able to validate a problem space, but then coming up with a path forward. So previous a previous slide you saw in concept two, but nonetheless still really important. And a couple of things we're just going to highlight here. Already mentioned that the problem statement is going to uh, pivot, but that also means that the problem statement is provided. It just means that it, your problem sponsor's work is not uh, indisputable. It is not static. It's going to constantly get updated based on the discovery that you conduct. And your responsibility in part is to get quickly get a deep understanding of those beneficiaries or pain points, their desired gains, and how a solution would, would be a corresponding element to making their lives better. Remember that we're also not here from the innovation paradigm perspective just to put on a flashy demo. That's not the point of all of this. Your real work is defining what the problem really is and then a plausible path forward. It's not here to build a device uh, necessarily. Tech can be a piece of that, but it's not the only piece. So even with technology problems, it's very common that when you're going to a solution domain after all of your discovery work, that the tech really isn't fundamentally the issue at hand. Other things like adoption or project management or policy can be at the forefront of really what the issue is that you're going for. So just make sure you keep that in mind. And if in your head you think, oh, this is just a technology problem I can solve with technology, take a step back. Remember that this is not your problem. You're here to investigate it without bias. So as previously mentioned as well, when you're looking at beneficiaries, there's a method to how you're actually able to kind of combine uh, your thoughts on how to attack this. So the first thing that you're going to do with beneficiaries is remember that they're all guesses at first. But what you're going to do is start with organization names. So imagine we're going to take an accordion, we're going to kind of open it up very, very broadly, and we're going to start with the names of organizations. But remember, an organization is really not the beneficiary even though individuals within that organization will absolutely benefit from a solution or even just a better understanding of the problem, you can't just call the United States Army. You have to talk to an individual. You have to find who this person is. So that's your first step is finding these organizations. The next thing that you're going to do is look for individuals within uh, a job category or job description that you would believe based on the problem that you have would be able to provide some information or actually maybe even become a beneficiary or a key partner during this process. So now we're kind of closing that accordion. And then what you do is you conduct your interviews. So you're going to find out about day in their life and you're going to figure out who they are. And you're going to do this over and over and over again until you've talked to enough individuals within a certain organization or type of job uh, and you're going to develop an archetype. So remember, then you're closing that accordion back in on itself, right? So what you want to remember with all of this is that you talk to one individual, you can draw conclusions on just that person. Uh, so say this is a software engineer, but now you've talked to maybe 15, 20, 30 software engineers, 
at that point, you've developed an archetype where you can say, well, within this limited confine of maybe this organization, we can draw conclusions on this population of people because of the number of individuals that we've spoken with. Well, what is your first step? when you're conducting beneficiary discovery? Well, you have to understand what your beneficiaries and your audience really needs. The only way you can do that is through discovery. And then by asking your questions, you're gonna figure out what are the biggest pains they're facing on a daily basis. Uh, if you could address these pains, maybe have like a magic wand and solve all their problems, what would that look like for them? And you do this by starting with a hypothesis or a number of hypotheses, uh, hypotheses, excuse me. So you might say, we believe that if X, then Y will happen. Well, you find out that information by talking to lots of people. And then the last little bit here is something I'd recommend, whether it's you're conducting an interview for your H4 course or you're preparing for your own job interview, is do a little bit of research on the person. Check out their social network on LinkedIn, um, you know, maybe any publications they have, and find out a little bit about this person. It just makes it a little bit easier to talk to them. It also shows that you're interested and committed to having a really uh, well-formed conversation. The next step that you're going to do when you're preparing for your beneficiary discovery is actually something that you do in tandem with that first step is you have to start generating names. Now, it says 100 here. And if you have to complete between 100 and 125 interviews over your H4 experience, you're going to need a lot more than 100 names. So one of that is going to be really important is if you don't have a LinkedIn account, now's a great time to put one together. It's a great networking tool for professionally, but also an opportunity for you to uh, reach into other people's networks and find out individuals that they may be, you may be able to speak with as part of this process. Uh, other places that you can get this from is maybe your peer group. So somebody in your class or on your team may have individuals in their personal or professional lives that you can uh, reach out to and have a discovery session with. Uh, if you look at conference attendees or conference proceedings, reach out to some of those speakers or researchers there. Um, you can think about something like RAND.org, which is a NGO that provides a lot of great information on a lot of the different topical areas that you may be diving into with your problem. Uh, so the next thing is, is also working with your mentors and sponsors. They have a Rolodex of individuals that more than likely have some type of experience in your problem domain, and they would end up being a great interview. And then before you go into those interviews is you want to figure out what you're going to talk to. So if you're talking to somebody who's very tech heavy, you probably want to have information or you probably want to discover information that has to do with some of their use of technology. If you're having somebody who's very policy oriented, you might be wanting to testing policy. So make sure that you figure out those if then statements that you want to be asking as part of your discovery session and also determining how it is that you're going to validate or invalidate that particular hypothesis. So rather than read all of these to you, what I'm going to suggest is this is a, a bunch of questions that you should ask as, in almost any interview, but especially those the first maybe dozen or so as a team that you're conducting. And this is really going to give you a good idea of maybe some of the areas to be cautious about and also provide information into other opportunities for discovery. Here are some questions that you want to ask probably at every point uh, during your discovery, whether it's early on or later on. So again, rather than reading all of these, make sure you take some of these questions and use these to your advantage as you're conducting your discovery. You also could ask these questions of your sponsor. Even though that person is more than likely not a beneficiary, they'll be able to provide some good insights as well. And then these are questions that regardless of where you are in your discovery process, these are ones that I absolutely recommend that you always ask. And the last three in particular are ones that I want to highlight on this particular slide. So the last three questions, who else should I talk to? This is something they like to call snowball effect when you're doing discovery work. And really what it means is that you start with one individual and you hope that they can give you three or four different names of people you can reach out to. But in tandem with that, it's always helpful to ask, well, can you introduce me? So if you have somebody that you don't know and you reach out to them, they may ignore you. But if, you know, the, the person you've spoken with, you had a great interview and they can send out a, a nice, warm welcome email to somebody else or a warm introduction, use that to your advantage. It helps a lot when there's a personal relationship there and somebody's extended that offer for you. And then last but not least is what else should I have asked you? And this one's really important because as good as your pre preparation work is, there you may have things that you simply forgot to ask or the questions that you didn't know you should have asked. So leave some time at the end of your interview to ask those three questions and let the respondent give you some good insights on things that perhaps you didn't think to ask. Now, the next thing is, well, what do you do with all this information once you've collected it? Now, there are methods that we're going to discuss in later concepts, but this is a really great organizational method that you can use early on. So your first one is going to be, what hypothesis are we testing? So what if-then questions are we planning on asking these different individuals. The next question is the experiment. Well, how have you tested it? 
by asking questions. And maybe later on, was you have a minimum viable product that's been built based on a lot of different um, analysis and data collection from your discovery, you can have, use those as tools as part of your discovery as well. But the most important thing really has to do with ask the questions, have you tested it? And then your results, what did you learn from that? So, you know, you've conducted a number of interviews with, a, with some people and you figure out, well, you know, we had these five hypotheses and two of them we weren't able to validate. Okay, well, we're going to put that in the back burner. And if we hear any patterns coming up with that information later on, we'll make sure and keep that in mind. But we're going to say we're putting these two away and we're going to keep the other three. And then what are we going to do next week? What questions and what hypotheses are you going to test moving forward? So this is a very structured approach to your hypothesis testing. So this is another uh, uh, interesting story that comes out of the special operations, the Navy SEALs in particular, their training. And the students received what they perceived to be a technology challenge at first, but was really interesting based on 96 interviews. The cadre, those training the next generation of Navy SEALs, their process actually worked pretty well, but it was very cumbersome and very slow. So what they really wanted is, I just want to do what we're doing right now, just do it easier and make it safer for those folks who are going through this training. And that's very powerful. Instead of making an assumption that, hey, we can just solve this with some type of automation or some different type of technology tool. Well, yeah, it's a piece of it, but it wasn't the be all end all. And this is what the discovery is going to be able to do for your team is really understand that problem ecosystem much, much more uh, fully. So what is beneficiary discovery kind of wrapping up that idea there? It's, it's a plan for you to get deeper beneficiary and deeper understanding of the problem domain. You're going to get an explanation of those pains and gains in their own words from those individuals. It's going to be start with that understanding of what the, what the audience needs. You're going to have to generate that listed name, and then it's going to also be tested through your questioning through your discovery sessions. Now, one of the tools that you can use as part of your beneficiary uh, discovery is the value proposition canvas. And if you'll notice on your screen, yep, it's a new canvas, and it, but it's coming from two distinct boxes in the desirability portion of the mission model canvas. It's coming from beneficiaries and value proposition. So let's take a look at that a little bit closer. So this is your value proposition canvas. And the easiest way for me to explain how to use this is think about the right side of the canvas is in the beneficiary's own words. So what jobs are they trying to complete? So their customer jobs, what do they do that day in the life to go back to that idea? What, what's their day-to-day -day look like? What tasks are they trying to complete? And then you look at what pains do they have with the current process or current policy or current technology, whatever it is in the area of your problem domain, and have them articulate that to you. And then also have them articulate what gains would they like to see ideally should a solution be put in place. Now, this doesn't have to be any broad specifics or any, any specific elements of a solution, but they could say, you know, it'd be really easier if I could do this. It would allow me to do this better and just let them articulate in their own words that right side of the canvas. And then what your op opportunity here to do is, is to actually start in your team's own words, the gain creators, the pain relievers, again, corresponding to the gains, um, the, the, the um, desired gains on the right-hand side, the pains as, as felt on the right-hand side as well. And then how would your potential solution, products and services, help alleviate those gains, or those pains, excuse me, and provide the gains that that beneficiary is looking for? So this is one of those tools. Now, one thing that I get asked frequently is, well, is everybody going to be a beneficiary? Does that mean I need to have a value proposition canvas for each of them? The answer is no. You might have a fantastic interview with someone who's a subject matter expert or is somebody who's a leader in industry that has great domain experience, but it's not necessarily a beneficiary. Still have those interviews. Very, very important to help you understand your domain, but they wouldn't necessarily need a value proposition canvas. So beneficiary discovery, we kind of break it into two distinct phases, but the area that I would really call attention to is that you're never done. As I've mentioned in, in the previous concept is that this is all iterative and you're going to be learning from each of these interactions that you have. So you're going to be doing exactly you see on here, who you're going to talk to, you're going to identify their pains and gains and get those into your value proposition canvas, figure out what a value proposition back to your uh, mission model canvas would look like develop an idea later on of what a minimum vial product could look like after you've done some good discovery work. And then you're going to take that MVP, you're going to quickly and cheaply build it. So this case could just be a drawing and we'll show you uh, during a future concept of what that could look like. Um, then you're going to bring that minimum viable product to your beneficiaries and then you're going to do it all over again. You're constantly learning and remember you're never done. It's just good enough. And that closes out concept number three. We'll look forward to seeing you on concept number four.